Thank you all for joining us this evening. My name is Willard Watson. I am the Programs and Outreach Director here at the Blowing Rock Art and History Museum. And this is our second official installment of uh, Brahms Book Club we're having for 2021. And today we're going to discuss Boone Before Boone, uh, the archeological record of Northwestern North Carolina through 1769. And we're fortunate to have author, Dr. Tom White, with us here today to uh, tell us about his book and allow us to interrogate him after his presentation. Um, so a little bit about Tom before he begins. Dr. White is professor in, in the anthropology department at Appalachian State University. For more than 40 years, he's been doing archeological research in the Appalachian Mountains and has published more than 50 articles and written more than 60 technical reports on his investigations. He lives in Sugar Grove, just west of Boone, North Carolina, and you might have seen him performing around the high country with one of his various bands. So when he's not digging up uh, spear points and finding animal bones, he is uh, playing some harmonica for us folks. <laughs> so we're really grateful to have Dr. White here with us this evening. So with that, I would like you all to please join me in welcoming Dr. Thomas White. Thank you, Willard. I'm, I'm really honored to be here with all of you, and um, I hope you learned something and enjoy this, this presentation. Um, this, uh, I didn't want you to see my bedroom, so this <clears throat> background virtual screen is, is me in 1967 at Machu Picchu, and I think that's where it all started, where my interest in archaeology might have begun. So uh, I've been at it for a long time. Okay, right. here we are, right? Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, um, when I was writing this book, which really took probably 30 years in, in some senses, I realized as I was writing chapter after chapter after chapter that, you know, the same thing was essentially going on um, millennium after millennium here in the high country before European contact. And it was really all a story about tourism. Um, for, for most of the human past, and, and here I'm not just talking about Northwestern North Carolina, but all of the world, um, humans have been migratory hunters and gatherers. And that's from the very earliest humans, Homo erectus, on up through the Neanderthals and the Denisovans and, and uh, early Homo sapiens, on up till only about 10,000 years ago, nearly all humans were migratory hunters and gatherers. And that was the case here in the high country from the earliest humans that were here in the late ice age, maybe 13,000 years ago at most, on up until um, the medieval warm period that began at around 900 AD. So in writing this book, I realized I'm, I'm really talking about tourism um, for, for thousands and thousands of years. You know, now most of our tourists, um, come from the South um, and some little few from the West and a few from the East and hardly any from the immediate North. Um, but as you guys have observed, and maybe some of you have even been participants, um, in, in the warmer months, you know, beginning in the spring, um, we start to see these license plates and they last until the fall after the turn of the leaves. And then uh, from about November until April, it's pretty much North Carolina license plates, um, except for the occasional person who sticks around for a little bit longer. And um, tourists have been coming here for tens of thousands of years, and they have used essentially the same routes um, in, in gaining access to this beautiful area that's a wonderful place to be during certain months of the year, but not other months of the year, unless you have you know, heating, and um, modern technology to help you survive through the winter. Generally, tourism is a seasonal event and that's the way it has been throughout the past. And our tourists today follow existing highways such as 321 from the south to get into Blowing Rock and into Boone um, or maybe coming up 105 from the, the south, southwest, uh, maybe coming through 21 from Eastern Tennessee and these highways that now bring our tourists to this region today are essentially following ex previously existing networks of paths and roadways. 
North Carolina alone um, has this um, vascular system of highways and roads that essentially follow previously existing wagon trails and pathways that were created by people before there was pavement, before there was a North Carolina DOT. And these are the paths of least resistance. Often these paths of least resistance follow water courses, uh, such as the, um, the, the uh, Watauga River Valley, the Catawba River Valley, the Yadkin River Valley, the New River Valley. Before we had the highways, there were wagon traces. And the new highways and roads essentially map onto these early wagon traces. I mean, not exactly, but they're roughly parallel. When you drive out 421, for example, coming west of Boone out towards where I live and where Dennis and Charlene live, you can actually see the original Route 421 going off into people's yards and winding all over the place. Um, uh, so the new highways have been straightened out a little bit and maybe raised above the river valleys to prevent you know, damage from flooding. But essentially they're following the same earlier road traces, which follow early wagon traces, which follow very early pathways, footpaths made by humans. And actually probably most of those footpaths that were made by humans in the ancient past were following game trails that were made by animals, non-human animals. And these very often frequent or frequently um, parallel river courses and stream courses, the paths of least resistance. So we can trace our modern human migrations back through time, and they're still following the same sorts of courses, really. And as I mentioned, those generally follow river courses. Now here's a circle kind of encircling the area, what is now Boone and Blowing Rock. And notice um, that the headwaters of the Yadkin and the Catawba and the New and the Watauga all sort of converge in our area. And as you all know, our area is a very confusing place topographically. The mountains are not nice, neat folds like they are up in the Shenandoah Valley there. It's kind of like a, I like to think of it as a a bearskin rug that's all been crumpled up by a dog on the floor, you know, there's no organization to it whatsoever. And our rivers and streams have eroded this area and created a network of ways for animals and humans to ascend um, the altitudes into um, what we call the Appalachian summit, our region. So here's a schematic just to outline that. And, and this has become a magical thinking for a lot of people who live in this area. They've even connected it to Old Testament biblical stories about the convergence of the four rivers and, uh, and that's kind of fun stuff. But um, what, what is clear here is that Northwestern North Carolina is not only a crossroads of rivers, but because of that, it has been a crossroads of human cultures. A lot of humans from a lot of places have passed through this area and come to this area throughout time from lots of different directions. And I really think it was all predicated by geography and geology and hydrology, the river courses. So now um, I want to kind of zero in on one, one particular archaeological site and one inroad of migration into the high country that I talk about quite a bit in my in my book, Boom Before Boom. Um, Route 321 coming from Lenore initially follows a lot of the headwaters of the Yadkin River um, and the valleys associated with that. And then it sort of kind of teams up with some of the headwaters actually of the Catawba River you know, it flows down into Charlotte and, and Northern South Carolina ultimately, and bringing you into Blowing Rock. So um, we have evidence in the past, and I'll show this with my slides, of a lot of human migration, seasonal migration coming from that region in particular. And um, so what 321 does now is, is a very nice straight line. If you look at the map right here, you know, this, uh, I'll use my cursor here. Um, you know, if, if you follow the river courses, it's, it's a little more meandering. 
but we've strained it out somewhat with our modern technology. But um, generally, it's following the same path that the original 321 and previous roads followed and previous wagon trails and previous footpaths to bring you up into Blowing Rock and then ultimately following the uh, part of the Johns River headwaters and then the middle fork of the New River into Boone. When you come from Blowing Rock into Boone, and you all witness this when you're doing this, you pass the little, the, the incredible toy store and the elk apartments and so on, and the Boone golf course is over here. This, you're coming through a gorge and suddenly the vista opens up and you're looking at the hospital and the Boone ABC store and Walgreens and Walmart, et cetera. So this has all been, you know, just all developed now. But try to imagine following a pathway along the middle fork of the South Fork of the New River here. And you see how 321 essentially does that. And you're coming into this high elevation valley. Imagine this without pavement and without buildings, nothing but trees, shrubbery, grasslands, grazing animals, lots of water, probably beaver dams, game all over the place. This would have been the first rest stop, really, for travelers coming up the mountain and into what, we, what I now call the Boone Valley. So here's a map of that, so you can sort of see the topography here. These are 40-foot contours, so this really is a gorge coming into Boone. And then it spills out into this large area of terraces and floodplains where the, where the different forks of the South Fork of the New River come together, Winkler's Creek, the East Fork, the South Fork, Middle Fork, um, all converge here. And it's very flat land with some nice elevated flat terraces overlooking this valley where all these rivers converge. This would have been um, Eden for hunters and gatherers coming to the high country during the warm seasons of the year. This whole area that I've colored in brown here is one big flat landform that now contains the hospital, Walgreens, CVS Pharmacy, the Boone ABC store, and various other houses and doctor's offices and so forth. This was one huge Native American campsite off and on from about 12,000 years ago all the way up until probably around maybe 1300 AD. This is, um, if you're standing on the floodplain of the Middle Fork and looking up at where the hospital is, the hospital roof is up here on the right. Okay, notice how this is a very high flat piece of ground. It's defensible, it's dry, it commands an amazing view um, of game, of the movements of animals, of the movements of humans, um, ideal place for human habitation in the ancient past. Unfortunately, it's all being bulldozed right now. In fact, here is the construction of the new hospital uh, stuff going on near the CVS pharmacy. That's my truck. This is about two months ago. And um, uh, even more development has happened here now. There was a house right there where that trailer is and a barn. It's all been bulldozed for uh, Appalachian Regional Health Facilities. Well, back in 1995, I think, or six, um, I was driving by um, where now stands a bank. It's the Yadkin Valley Bank, I think, um, near the CVS Pharmacy. And also the CVS Pharmacy is there. Um, in the upper right-hand corner here, here's the Boone ABC store for reference. All of you know where that is, right? I know I do. And um, so this, this um, was a vacant lot that was for sale for development. And Ray Howells Architects was um, um, advertising this land. And um, I thought, gosh, that might be just one of the last islands um, of undisturbed ground in this whole Boone city limits that might actually have some vestiges of pre-contact Native American um, occupation there. So I asked Ray, hey, can I go out and do some test excavations to see if there's anything there? And his daughter was an anthropology major. So he said, yeah, go for it. So. I went out there, did some test excavations, started finding stone artifacts, ended up having two or three summer field schools out there. 
And this is some of our work going on in, in one of the only really well-preserved little parts of that piece of land, because we found that there had been houses there um, and various other buildings and much of it had been plowed and disturbed. But we found one little patch of about, you know, about five meters by five meters that was pretty well intact. And so we did our field school excavations there just to, to salvage any information that we could before this property got developed. And so archaeology is a mess like this sometimes, especially when you have lots of students, students learning how to do it. So these are our excavations. And we were blown away by what we discovered there. And, uh, and we also had some wonderful help from kids um, and the public on this project, which proved to be very beneficial in two different ways. But um, and we were so surprised to find evidence of the ancient past because right below the grass in some parts, we found these foundation walls of buildings and outbuildings and houses and walkways. Um, but somehow preserved in and amongst those things, we found evidence at this site, some of which dated back to the late Ice Age, so we call this Paleo-Indian times, dating back to 11,000 years ago or more, on up to more recent times. So I want to go back now, using this site as, a, uh, as an example, back to the earliest evidence on this site. So 11,000 years ago or 9,000 BC, uh, those of you in this room who are my age remember Sherman and Peabody and the Wayback Machine. So we're going to go way back to 9,000 years ago, or 11,000 years ago, or 9,000 BC, when Boone might have looked something like this if you came through that um, gorge, what is now 321, and looked out. Um, maybe the mountains would have not been this bald, but at that time, this was the late Ice Age. And there was tundra, at least on the higher peaks, and Boone was a boreal forest, conifers, uh, with some parkland sort of area. And probably a lot of those streams were dammed up by beavers, so there might have been a mosaic of lakes in, in, in and around what is now Walmart. Okay, a very different climate with mammoths and mastodons and extinct horses and giant ground sloths and and 100 pound armadillos and 300 pound beavers and Irish elk and various other megafauna that are now extinct were running around in this area at that time, as well as humans. Some of the early evidence we found on this site, by the way, we call it the Gwyn Hayes site because Gwyn Hayes was the former landowner of that place. That's what we like to do, honor the uh, original landowners if we can. Uh, includes this um, piece of a spear point, and um, it's there's not much left of it. Here's the notch on this side, and so if you if you imagine it unbroken, it would have extended over here with a corresponding notch and the point way at the top. And this is made out of material, stone material from the Piedmont of North Carolina, some 50 or 60 kilometers east southeast of Boone. That's where this rock geologically occurs naturally. Um, it's called vitric tuff, which is a form of dacite and a relative of rhyolite. That stuff doesn't occur up here in the mountains. And so um, just by recognizing the geologic source of the material from which the spear point was made, we know that people were migrating up from the Piedmont up through what is now, you know, the globe and Boone or blowing rock on into Boone, bringing this material with them. And we typologically know that this spear point dates to that time period because we have found these on many sites on which we have gotten carbon-14 dates. So when I find one that's of this style with this kind of a notch and this kind of a base, I know I'm looking at something that's 11,000 years old. Also next to that, we found this core scraper. This is about the size of a baseball. And it's a very distinctive kind of tool uh, from which stone flakes were derived for using as cutting tools, butchery tools, but also this object itself had a very steep scraping edge on it. And these were used to scrape hides. We know this through experimental archaeology. And in fact, very possibly uh, caribou, elk, or even mastodon or mammoth hides, big mammal scraping tools. And this is made out of that same material. It doesn't look like it because it's so highly weathered. This is a patina 
or a cortex that has resulted from this object being in acidic soil for 11,000 years and beginning to weather. But if I was to break this in half, it would be that same pretty greenish blue shiny material on the inside. So we have evidence of hunter gatherers coming into the high country from east, southeast, um, 9,000 BC. And it's interesting to me that all of the objects that we found on this site that date to that time period are coming from the southeast. That is at a time when the Americas were not heavily populated by humans. Humans were just beginning to populate the nether reaches of North America. And the mountains were the last frontiers during the Ice Age because they were brutally cold and not very good places for um, habitation really at any time of the year. So, so these are the very first mountaineers, the first pioneers of the Appalachian Mountains in prehistory dating back to about 11,000 years ago. And they're coming from the Piedmont area where, which is closer to the coast and where humans appear to have been much earlier. In fact, we have sites on the Piedmont and on the intercoastal plain dating to nearly 18,000 years ago. So then uh, moving up through time, 6,000 to maybe 5,000 years ago, people continued to come up to um, the high country and probably following those same paths made by their predecessors during the late ice age. Once those pathways were established and hunters and gatherers continually migrated into the mountains, they would have followed the same pathways um, um, and therefore maintaining those pathways and widening them and, and ensuring their existence and coming to the same sites over and over again because they succeeded in previous seasons at those sites. So why wouldn't they come back to those sites? Furthermore, they knew that that place was there. They knew that it was an abundance of resources and had everything else that they needed, uh, fresh water and a, a good view of the valley. They would have come back to those same places year after year after year. And they probably even had a name for that site. I call it the Gwen Hay site, but who knows what the Native Americans might have called that place. Well, um, we found artifacts right under the sod. Literally, we peeled back the sod and we found clusters of quartz flakes like this next to my trowel. And, and we found spear points with these quartz flakes. Quartz is a local material, so it wasn't imported. And um, the spear points that we found next to these stone flakes from the making of stone tools date to about 6,000 to um, 5,000 BC, right under the sod, where people were playing around in the 1970s, playing badminton and having backyard barbecues and things like that. Right under their feet was this evidence. And some of the spear points we found at this site that date to that time period are those that I've circled here. And most of them, interesting to me, are made of either locally available quartz like D here, or these materials, these different kinds of cherts and chalcedonies that come from the West over in the Ridge and Valley province. So here, as we move up in, up in time and we get up into a time around six, 7,000 years ago, when the interior of North America was increasing in human populations. Here we're getting migrations from the West, hunters and gatherers coming up into the Boone Valley, probably following the Watauga River and ultimately camping out at this same site and leaving their evidence behind, which consists of stone tools and other artifacts made out of lithic materials that geologically derive from West of here over in Eastern Tennessee in what's called the Valley and Ridge Province. We also found associated with that time period in those artifacts, um, this object up on the upper left here, A, is a broken atlatl or spear thrower weight. Here's a complete one on the bottom. These sort of banana shaped rocks with holes drilled through the middle that were attached to the shaft of the spear thrower these were used to um, as sort of an extension of the arm to give better leverage in the projection of a spear that was hooked onto the end of the atlatl. Um, and this is the precursor of bow and arrow technology throughout the world. 
Um, and uh, bow and arrow doesn't come in, in into our region, for example, until probably around 3,000 years later. And this is, you know, maybe what that valley might have looked like at this time around six, 7,000 years ago. This is during the mid-Holocene period. It was a warmer, drier period um, than it is now, or no, than it was earlier. Um, and essentially the modern fauna and the modern vegetation would have been in an effect by around that time. And this is um, a, a drawing of what that campsite at the Gwyn Hay site might have looked like at, at six or 7,000 years ago. Migratory hunters and gatherers with temporary structures, maybe three or four or five families um, traveling together to camp out for a few weeks or a month or two to exploit the resources in the valley. And then once they had used up all of the um, resources within the region and were with the changes in seasons, they would have moved on either to, either to the east or the west, but following those pathways along the river courses in doing so. All right, so moving up in time, Simon and Peabody are gonna bring us on up to only 1,700 BC otherwise known as 3,700 years ago. And um, at the same site, we found this wonderful hearth fireplace and in and amongst the rocks, burned rocks, we found some charcoal that I was able to get a carbon 14 date on. And the carbon 14 date was 3,700 BP, which is before present, um, uh, plus or minus 30, something like that, a ballpark date. And these kinds of artifacts that date to about that time period, um, the one on the bottom left is a big stone knife made out of quartzite. And that quartzite comes from the Irwin Formation, 30 kilometers to the west. The middle one is a yellow jasper arrow point, the earliest evidence of bow and arrow technology in our region. So dating to about 1700 BC, made out of yellow jasper also from um, the Valley and Ridge province to the west. And then H is a quartz spear point, probably made out of local quartz. So throughout time, prehistoric time, we have evidence of humans periodically camping at this site because it was a great place to live. And even they might have come back to this site year after year, knowing that when they came there, they could also use the same hearth that they had the year before. They probably also knew that they could even pick up some of the broken artifacts that they and their ancestors had left there and use them or rework them into new tools. So these became sort of like cultural quarries for scavenging and recycling. So there's a, one archeologist once said that there's a statistical tendency for occupational redundancy of archeological sites. And that's what he was talking about. And it's really fun to look at the materials that the, the artifacts are made of because we have stone artifacts at the Gwyn Hay site and other sites in the Boone area. A lot of them are made from the Valley and Ridge sedimentary rocks like chert, jasper, quartzite, chalcedony. A lot of them are made out of Mount Rogers rhyolite from up in Virginia near Grayson Highlands. A great deal of them, especially the very early ones are made out of the Piedmont materials. So just by looking at what the stone tools are made of, we can begin to reconstruct people's migration patterns from east to west and north to south and, and begin to you know, understand something about their lives and their movements. Moving up through time, um, as we get up towards um, around maybe two, 300 AD, we start to see the first evidence of ceramic technology in the high country, pottery. And a lot of the first pottery that we see showing up on sites is what we call limestone tempered pottery. The potters in ancient times and even in modern times mix clay with other things, uh, non-plastic, non-clay materials like uh, crushed stone or sometimes even crushed fibers or bone or shell. And some of the early pottery that we find in our region, region is limestone tempered pottery. And look at this potsherd in the top here. You see all these holes in the pottery here? You can see it in this one here too. 
Um, those holes are there because limestone was mixed with the clay. And then when the pottery was broken and, and discarded on the ground, acids in the soil dissolved the calcium in the limestone and dissolved the limestone, leaving these holes. It's like Swiss cheese. Well, there's no limestone in Western North Carolina, except for in Linville Caverns. <laughs> that one little opening in the, grand, in the grandfather mountain geology. So this uh, pottery is being made in the Ridge and Valley province where limestone occurs over in Eastern Tennessee on the other side of Watauga Reservoir. And still we're having hunters and gatherers come to the mountains seasonally, but now they're not only bringing stone tools with them, they're also bringing their pottery, which contains crushed limestone and using it and breaking it and leaving it behind. And um, I did a study of the distribution of limestone tempered pottery along the Watauga River in Watauga County by looking at the amounts of limestone tempered pottery in various rock shelters located along the river here. So here's Watauga River and here's where it takes a bend and goes on up through Fosco towards Grandfather Mountain. But um, I looked at the pottery from these rock shelters and sure enough, down here, you know, towards below Valley Cruces, the 10% uh, of the pottery is limestone tempered. As you move on up and you get um, closer to um, uh, maybe Camp Broadstone, we're at the six, down to 6%. And as you get on up into Fosco, we're down to 3%. This suggests to me that you know people are actually migrating up the river, bringing their pottery with them, but not, not as often going further upriver. So this is proof of human migration, I think and hunters and gatherers seasonally visiting the high country and bringing their pottery with them. Well, as we move up in time, something happened around 900 AD that affected much of the Northern Hemisphere called the Medieval Warm Period. And this had a very big impact on people in Northern latitudes and in higher altitudes, such as the Appalachian summit where we live. Um, the medieval warm period was just a slightly warmer time lasting from 900 AD until about 1300 AD, but it permitted people in Northern Europe to um, farm lands in higher um, um, latitudes that had not previously been cultivated because the, the growing seasons became extended in higher latitudes. It did the same thing for higher altitudes in the Rockies, in the Andes, and in the Appalachians people were able to move up into the higher altitudes and begin to grow crops. Prior to 900 AD, there were farmers or horticulturalists in lower elevations, you know, down the Mississippi Valley and, and, and even down um, in uh, the headwaters of the Savannah River Valley on the Piedmont, but not in the high country here because maize farmers, and maize was the primary crop of the early farmers of native North America, could not grow maize in, um, at these elevations above 2,500 feet because the growing season was too short until 900 AD because of this medieval warm period. This was also the time when the Vikings were able to make their voyages across the Northern Atlantic. That warming trend allowed this to happen, allowed them to establish settlements in Iceland and Greenland and even North America, such as at La Anse Meadows in Newfoundland. Um, because of that warm trend. So um, at about AD 1000, shortly after this medieval warm period started, we see the first evidence of permanent habitation, or at least experiments in permanent habitation in the high country. And the best example is the Ward site located at the confluence of Cove Creek and Watauga River, kind of out near where I live. And um, this beautiful second terrace, that's Ray Ward's barn there, um, has been explored by ASU archaeologists since the early 1970s. And uh, excavations have revealed there um, the remains of a small village. Uh, the little white dots that you see up here, Mark, uh, indicate the locations of post holes where posts were put in the ground. So this is the village wall, OK? Um, the river is actually um, up here. And here's the post molds of a circular house. These larger white things are other features such as hearths. That's the central fireplace of this circular house. There was about 
16 or 20 feet in diameter. Um, and uh, so this was a permanent village where people lived year round. Here is that house just inside the village wall. These are the post holes excavated. Here's the circular house. It was a doubled walled structure, which is substantial. It was probably covered with daub with a central fireplace. This is a house that would have been occupied in the winter as well as in the summer, where they might've even really lived mostly outside of the house in the summer. First evidence of permanent habitation in this high elevation around 1000 AD. And they had some very beautiful pottery. These are some rim sherds from that site. And it's very similar to pottery found further south of here in the Asheville Basin. And um, archaeologists that preceded me back in the 70s thought that this was prehistoric Cherokee pottery and that therefore the ward site was a prehistoric Cherokee village. But I've since debunked that. Um, there's no evidence that this is Cherokee. In fact, there's absolutely zero evidence that there were ever any Cherokees in the northwestern counties of North Carolina. And this kind of bothers me because everybody's gone to these, these um, very um, generous land acknowledgement statements now, um, attributing, this, attributing this region to the Cherokees. Um, but uh, and, um, I'm an archaeologist and I'm a scientist, and I haven't found any evidence that they were ever here. Um, this pottery, in fact, is more similar to that found on the Piedmont of North Carolina, which was the homeland of Siouan speakers, the ancestors of the Catawba Indians. Nevertheless, I digress. This is an artist's reconstruction of a similar archaeological site, not the ward site, but this is very much what the ward site might have looked like with the village wall being more of a fence, really, not a fortification, but maybe a symbolic demarcation of what was the village and what was not. And inside that, circular houses may be covered with bark or thatch and a plaza area where people conducted various activities. But the, the ward site was short-lived and so was generally uh, permanent or year-round habitation of the high country because very soon after the medieval warm period was, was benefiting humans, the little ice age followed. Now this was not an ice age and you know in um, with you know ice and glaciers and mastodons returning it was simply a, a minor dip in temperatures and these different lines are different proxies for estimating temperature changes over time ice core data oxygen isotope data whatever but there was a dip in temperatures between 1300 AD and the beginning of the industrial revolution in the mid 1800s and this affected the lives of animals and especially the lives of humans in the high country. There was, it was impossible for people to have a successful harvest of maize during the Little Ice Age. And so the place was abandoned, at least in terms of village life. And it returned back to seasonal visitation for Native Americans coming up in the summer months in small groups to exploit the abundant resources in the mountains and then to get out with the onset of winter. And this also affected the Vikings. The Viking settlements of, of uh, Newfoundland and Greenland failed and they were abandoned in about 1350 because of the Little Ice Age. Well, and also during the Little Ice Age, we had our first Floridian come to the high country and that was Hernando de Soto who came from La Florida in uh, 1540. And he arrived in um, the mountains of North Carolina, probably around what is Elk Park now, along what is now 1980, on May 26, 1540. And his chroniclers who, who documented the Entrada and its expedition mentioned that they were freezing their butts off in, on May 26th when they got into the mountains. Of course, they were from Spain, from Florida. So, you know, they were wimps when it came to dealing with cold temperatures maybe, but they, they very much remarked on how cold it was because this was the little ice age, which was a little bit, a few degrees on the average colder than it is today, if you average out all the temperatures. And uh, uh, this is to show DeSoto, the first Floridian coming to the high country. And, um, 
Um, a recent, recent reconstruction by uh, uh, archaeologist Katie Sampek using GIS and least cost analysis. She estimates that DeSoto traveled from Jawara, which is down on the headwaters of the Catawba River at what is now known as the Berry site near Morganton, that they would have come up through what is now Elk Park following what is now Route 19E over into the Nolichucky, Holston, uh, the Nolichucky and Holston River Valleys to get to a town called Chiaha um, on the Holston River in 1540. Well, moving up in time, our next recorded visitor to the high country was Bishop August Spangenberg, the Moravian, who he and his group were looking for lands to claim for Moravian missions in December 1751. And it's pretty well documented that he probably came up through what is now the globe area, up perhaps through Blowing Rock, maybe up to the Gwyn Hay site, I don't know, um, somewhere up here in the high country, ultimately probably seeing the New River Valley in 1751. And they made the mistake of coming up in December. Um, it was probably, you know, getting pretty cold. Um, they couldn't find food for their horses. Um, they were starving, the horses were starving. And they recorded, documented that they saw no humans and no evidence of humans when they got up into the higher elevations. And I think that's really important because that was, you know, right smack in the middle or towards the end of the Little Ice Age. And they were here in December. There were probably humans here the previous August, um, but they were gone by the time Spangenberg made his way up into the mountains. And so he was one of the last tourists before the really big onslaught of humans into the mountains that followed when Euro-Americans um, came up into the high country, no doubt following the pathways that were created by Native Americans and various animals that became wagon roads, that became our highways, our roads, and ultimately our highways. And that is my, my discourse on tourism in the high country. Thank you for listening. And now you can ask me questions. <laughs> um, you've called the period between 900 and 1300 AD the medieval um, warm period. Yes. Um, I've followed studies of the Maya, and that's when the, the classic Maya period collapsed and went yes. into drought and other problems. Yeah. And I've never heard it called the medieval warm period before. Uh -huh. There's a, a really wonderful book I highly recommend. I don't know what libraries might have it, but it's by Brian Fagan, who's an archaeologist um, at uh, Santa Barbara, University of California, Santa Barbara. And it's called The Great Warming. And he talks about the impacts of that period on cultures around the world. So, and I can't remember if, if he addresses the Maya, but yeah, the Maya, um, um, they were, um, this warming trend that affected the Northern hemisphere had different impacts on other parts of the world. In, in some parts of the world, it manifested itself as a horrible drought. And if I recall, the Maya were affected by a serious drought around that time which would have just decimated them because they were so heavily dependent on their agriculture and rainfall and so much of their gods and religions and sacrifices were all about that. Um, so that would be a really great source to look at if you can find it. Brian Fagan's The Great Warming. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. Hi. Hi, I'm Michael. I'm a student at Appalachian State University. And I was, um, today I was um, fascinated by going back to the, from the trails to, oh no, our highways to the trails and, but um, do you know anything about the uh, Native Americans after 19th century? Cause I was reading, um, um, and listening to Native American stories told by Ray Hicks. 
-hmm. And also he was talking a lot about um, arrowheads. Then he brought it to like um, a math store to get some coins. <laughs> <laughs> then, I, then I think he's, his talk, the Native Americans he was talking was not before um, 17th century or so. Yeah, um, I'm not sure what your question is, but I actually met Ray Hicks and, uh, <laughs> and so of course he was a storyteller and you know, a lot of it's a, a blend of fiction and fact and, um, and really his stories are just a wonderful expression of, of the local uh, mountain people's um, beliefs about their past and their history and Native American past. And so, um, you know, I can't remember any of the stories about Native Americans in this region, but uh, a lot of the, the local folks um, here have, the local farmers have for generations collected artifacts. There, um, I often meet people who have boxes with thousands and thousands of stone artifacts in their collections. And, um, and of course, they all say, you know, these were Cherokee Indians and, and I'm descended from a Cherokee person and, and so on. And, you know, some of what they say in terms of their own genealogy might be true, but um, it's, it's really hard to say. Uh, and I'm going to just repeat something I said. Um, you know, when I first got here, I was told that this was Cherokee territory and that the people who lived here before the whites were the Cherokees. And so I expected to find that evidence, but I've been doing archeology span for 30 years here in, in Boone. And the, the, the material technological signature of the Cherokee Indians is something we call koala pottery named after the koala boundary, which is the name of their reservation. Koala pottery is so distinctive, it can't be confused with anything else. Not one piece of koala pottery has been found in Watauga County or Ash County or Allegheny County, probably not even Avery County. And so until I find that smoking gun, I can't link uh, any of the evidence here with, with the Cherokees. And Maako, I don't know if I answered your question at all, but uh, if I didn't, please repeat it um, and I'd be happy to try again. Oh no, it was great. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. That, there yeah. What about the um, patterns on the pottery? Any tracing those patterns? Um, from a certain area, you know, traveling up here? No, um, they are very interesting patterns and I know that they meant something to the makers, right? Um, they must have symbolized something. And I wish I could, I'll send you this um, act, after our talk. I found um, an article about a burial urn found in in, uh, in England, I think it was called the Kenilworth site, I think it was called, um, a burial urn, all right? And it's got a rim strip on it, like the ones I showed you from the word site. And it has the exact same design in the rim, exactly the same design. And so, <laughs> you know, those are kind of universal kinds of things that meant something to, you know, that doesn't mean there was some connection between England and North Carolina. That's what I'm saying. There's no way, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, it just seems to be a common motif that might have been shared by so many people. And since that th that's the case, I, I, can't, I can't give it any meaning um, other than to know that it must have meant something to somebody. And we see those patterns on pottery all over North America. Um, yeah. So... Uh, that's that's a, probably not a knowable thing, and that's really unfortunate. Yeah, I was just wondering about that. I mean, they seem so distinctive in a way. Yeah, I, at first I thought so. Um, I can't wait to send you this to show you the the uh, Kenilworth burial urn pottery right next to a piece of that pottery. You'll just be stunned. <laughs> it almost will make you think that somebody 
hopped on an airplane and flew over here in 1300 AD and, and dropped some pottery. <laughs> wow. it, I have a question. Sure. Did you say when these annual migrations stopped? Well, um, I, th I think they might have stopped right around that time of the medieval war when we see permanent occupation of humans that up was here. A long time ago. That yeah. Was the, white settlers or anybody, anything. Like that. But I think that after, uh, after 900, when people began to experiment with permanent village life up here, um, there still might have been some other groups migrating into the area at that time. Of course, then they would have been encroaching on somebody's territory because once people establish villages and then they lay claim to the animals and the firewood and the resources surrounding their villages. But after the medieval warm period, when that fell apart, I think that um, people then re returned to just coming up here seasonally for a while. Um, because I do find, I have found some pottery dating to the 1500s in a rock shelter here, but it was pottery that's, um, that we find down on the Piedmont and the foothills, probably Siouan speaker Indian pottery. So it looks like people were still coming up here, but only um, we only find temporary campsites, not villages, during that little ice age. So that's very interesting that you're able to draw those uh, connections for tourism from the past into the present and how people have uh, constantly migrated in and out of the region because of the weather. Now, um, a, a couple like, so small question I've got is what is uh, experimental archeology? span And then the larger question I have is was there any evidence of maybe these earlier uh, people that would migrate into the region kind of treating the upper elevation as more of a commons area? Um, I know that in early, uh, the like Scots Irish settlers would use a lot of the higher elevation mountaintops for commons for their grazing animals. And that was kind of a practice for those European settlers. But um, any evidence of maybe cultural interaction or uh, different cultures using those areas as commons? So the first question, experimental archaeology, is something that I actually teach and have been doing since, the, since my master's thesis. Um, since we can't, um, we don't have time machines and we can't witness what took place in the past, in order to interpret that evidence, and this is a lot like what forensic scientists do with crime scenes, you have to reenact a lot of this um, stone tool making, stone tool use, house building, house burning, um, um, replicating butchery patterns and, and just everything so that you can see the, the material products of your behaviors through experimentation and then compare that to the material products of ancient humans and therefore go, ah, this is what these people are doing because it looks exactly what I just did, you know? So that's a big part of, of archeology span and geology and paleontology and any science that deals with, with the past. Um, I even have an experimental site on my property where um, my students, we, we wrote an ethnography. We wrote a story about the lives of some migratory hunters and gatherers coming into the mountains it was essentially like writing a script for a play. And then we acted it out on my farm and we created a, a hunter-gatherer campsite and it's been laying dormant for five years. We even had motion activated cameras on it thereafter to monitor what animals did to the site and dogs taking bones away and crows running off with animal bones and things. And uh, next fall, I'm gonna excavate that site. And anyway. So that's really a big part of archaeology, um, but the uh, the idea of uh, sharing the high country, um, most hunters and gatherers, migratory hunters and gatherers, since they do move quite a bit across the landscape, they don't have really solid territories and ownership um, of of places, and um, so they are shared and and they are negotiated with neighboring groups 
who might use those same resources in those same places at the same time. And so I think that's probably what was going on through much of the uh, pre-contact period up here. So we do see evidence of humans coming from the west up the Watauga Valley, from the east up the Yadkin Valley and, and into the high country and bringing those lithic materials and artifacts made of them with them. Um, and there's really no evidence of, of competition or warfare until you still see people settling down into villages and claiming the resources of in a certain radius around their home place. That's when you see violent competition. And that starts um, in the general area surrounding the mountains here, probably as early as maybe about 200 AD down in the headwaters of the Tennessee over in Eastern Tennessee. Um, um, but I, I haven't seen any evidence of it up here, but of course we only have really one village site that we've explored and that's the, uh, the uh, ward site. And there were virtually no human remains found there. So we couldn't look for inflicted wounds and, and uh, broken bones from defensive measures and things like that. So not sure. Um, did I answer all of your questions? <laughs> yeah, well, okay. definitely, definitely mine. And this, this has been wonderful to get an insight into the process of archaeology and uh, get, glean a greater appreciation for the work that you actually do. And seeing how small some of those artifacts are, it's amazing that you um, can, you know, extrapolate such a large story from that. We, you know, we have to squeeze so much out of what we've got here because we don't have statuary and paintings and temples and cemeteries. Uh, you know, like, you know, you wonder why so many archeologists work in Egypt and Mesoamerica because it's, it's so damn easy, <laughs> but it's not any more interesting to me. I think that, you know, the, even though the archeological record up here is maybe scant, um, it's still as much a mystery and, and as much and, and as fun a puzzle as any of that. So, <laughs> and we just make it up as we go along. <laughs> There's, a, I used to have this on a T-shirt: uh, the um, Archaeologist Creed, early to bed, early to rise, dig like hell, and make up post hoc accommodative scenarios. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this has been wonderful, uh, Dr. White. Appreciate your time and uh, insight. And um, we're at time. So unless anybody has any other questions for them. Uh, yeah, and feel free, feel free to email me questions. It's w-h-y-t-e-t-r at appstate.edu. Maybe, uh, you know, that can be shared around among you. And um, I mean, I'd be happy to answer any questions that might come up after the fact. I just had one quick question, if that's okay, if it, yeah. if it wouldn't bother you. Not at all. Uh, my name is Michael. I just moved um, to Boone. My, my partner's pursuing a degree at App State. So I'm, I, I'm new in town um, mm -hmm. and I'm loving it here. But it's interesting because I had a friend just tell me the other day, she said, oh, you have to look up the Cherokee and the Trail of Tears. That's really, you know, they were in Western North Carolina and I'm a history teacher and I, I don't specialize in Native American anything, but um, I found that curious. I said, I didn't know the Cherokee were in, in Western North Carolina. And then I asked my partner and she said, oh yeah, Cherokee, you know, around here. And I just wonder if, um, why you think people just kind of say, oh, it must be Cherokee. Is it probably because that's just such a well-known name and no, very few people would know any other, any other tribes like the Catawba or something like that? You nailed it. You absolutely nailed it. I mean, that is, I think, the reason. Um, now, of course, in historic times, um, meaning, meaning after the initial white settlement of this region, some Cherokee families did move up into the Northwestern counties very possibly after the removal period, after Andrew Jackson chased them all out of you know, Cherokee um, in 1836 through eight. So, you know, there probably is some Cherokee ancestry and uh, or shared inheritance, I should say in this region. 
Um, but I think it is largely because, you know, that is um, a popular name. Everybody knows it. And, and Cherokee's not too far away. It is Western North Carolina, but it's extreme Southwestern North Carolina. And um, it never would have occurred to them that maybe the ancestors of the Catawbas or some other group was up in this region. And, you know, so many native groups became extinct before we even knew their names. Uh, so who, who knows, you know, there could have been several groups occupying or at least visiting this region for whose names have never been recorded in history. So Cherokee is, is the, the knowable entity, yeah. Thank you so much. I really, really appreciated this talk. And it was really cool to be wandering around town for the last few months and then finally hear all this really neat information. So thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank all of you.